Anyway, thank you very much for coming tonight um, to ACOR, which is my second home. Um, just about, I spend more time at ACOR than I do in my house in Walla Walla. So, um, we've been working out here now for the 10th year. Uh, but I just mentioned that uh, we have a consortium of people. York Rowan, Alex, uh, Alexander Wass, Moran Kersel, and me. And we've been here uh, uh, surveying and excavating in a very dramatic landscape, as you can see. Um, the Black Desert... <laughs> no idea how this works. Remember, this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the Habit the Sham, or the Black Desert, is part of three different countries, Syria, uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, the most dramatic part of this is in Jordan, <coughs> the one that's got the most varied uh, kind of landscapes uh, in, the, in the area. And uh, um, it has not had a very good reputation in the last uh, 150 years. Um, mainly Westerners have uttered this, at least in English, uh, and I imagine an awful lot of Arabs have also said that this is an odious uh, flat top slag heap that we're looking at. Um, it is not a popular destination for anybody, uh, whether you're Jordanian or Syrian, or if you are uh, European or uh, North American. Um, time and time again, there have been comments on how lifeless this place is. It looks like a dead fire. It is sinister. It does not bode well for anybody who was out there. Um, it is the epitome of loneliness. And uh, it's desolate. And for the people who went out there and died, it's extremely desolate. Um, now, our earliest clear ev uh, evidence of what was going on, or what had gone on in the past in the, in the Black Desert, came from the pilots of the Baghdad, the Royal Air Force Baghdad to Cairo uh, airmail route. And uh, this map from the book called the Cairo Baghdad Airmail Route uh, also shows some of the kind of uh, disappointment that uh, people had when they went out there. We have, in fact, oh, sorry. We don't go back. How do I get that back? Well, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> Here we go. Um, between Ziza, which would be uh, Amman, the, the airport, and Azraq, it was called the Plain of Sorrows. Again, not terribly good for public relations for the Jordanian tourism industry. In the Black Desert itself, we have the land of conjecture. And it's stated as the land of conjecture principally because it was very difficult to cross. It's covered with basalt, uh, the very large stones. Camels hate that area. It probably has never been uh, a principal uh, sort of tourist or even uh, economic uh, area for uh, exploitation. And then when we get closer to the Jordanian-Iraqi border, we have the plain of unfulfilled desires. So uh, this raises an awful lot of questions. Uh, this area out here uh, does have archaeological sites. It indicates that there are people who have been living out there, but what kind of people were they? That's the question. We'll talk a little bit about some of these sites, but very briefly, I'll concentrate on the two sites that we, um, York and Morag and Alex and I, have concentrated on. Um, but in, the, in essence, some of the earlier publications about archaeological research out there reinforced the, the sort of image of what that uh, desert uh, area was like. The Wela is one of the sites in the Black Desert that was excavated by Allison Betts. Allison Betts was one of the most fantastic pioneers out in the Black Desert. She was uh, certainly the first woman out there, and in fact, she was probably the first person to uh, spend a lot of time doing archaeological research. The Wela was one of the sites that she excavated. It consisted of a single structure that was not occupied for very long. It was probably revisited uh, several times. 
but it gives you the indication of impermanence and small population. Uh, Jebel Naja is another one of her sites. Again, probably a single family, possibly two families out here with animal pens mostly around the, the main uh, uh, residential area. And again, this was used for only probably a, a month or two a year by very few people and uh, probably only revisited a few times during its entire existence. Um, al as you can see, is in the middle of a, a, a plain of basalt stones, certainly not an appealing looking uh, environment today. Uh, it probably had more families living together. It's uncertain how many of those uh, drawings represent dwellings and how many are storage areas and how many are animal pens. But I would guess that we had no more than eight families living together. Again, occupied for very short periods of time and for uh, only a limited number of revisits during its occupation. So again, we're these tend to uh, support this image of a very inhospitable uh, landscape. In Burku, where there was permanent water in the lake at Burku, um, one would expect to see, in fact, much greater um, exploitation. And there are a number of sites, all of those numbers uh, indicate uh, archaeological sites. Only one of them, number 27, is of any size. But again, of any size, actually I don't mean that, of any duration. It consists, again, of a single house, but was occupied for hundreds of repetition, of repeated occupations. Um, here again, more and more, you, the more and more you read about these early archaeological projects, the more and more convinced you are that this was a horrible place to be. Wadi Jalat is not in the Black Desert, it's in the plain, or it's in the steppe, east of the airport, um, and in, in a sense it's very parallel uh, to Wasad Pools because it had this large wadi that had a lot of natural pools so that in the rainy season uh, these pools would fill up and some of those pools are, are very large in terms of quantity. But once again, here the sites in the late Neolithic period were of one or two houses only. And as you can see, very insubstantial construction. Uh, a single row of upright slabs, but no other construction uh, in the walls. Um, this one was occupied twice. There, uh, I should say there are two phases of occupation. But again, walls probably never any higher than one or two stomp stones high, uh, emphasizing the uh, temporal, uh, the, the, the loss of any kind of prolonged occupation out there, even though these people were farmers. Uh, these people probably had uh, uh, crops out in the, the plain on both sides of the wadi, but they didn't stay there for very long. They simply came back for the, uh, uh, for the harvest. And that's the impression one gets from reading the reports. So, what about these people? Were they at the end of the world? Did they live on a day-by-day -day basis? Were they threatened with starvation? Were there problems in terms of maybe competition from other people who were hungry? Well, I would say probably uh, no. Um, in fact, from our work out at uh, Wissad Pools especially, but also in the mesas themselves, uh, we've got an awful lot of information that indicates that there were people out there who remained in the, uh, in the Black Desert, some of them possibly all year round, but certainly uh, for months at a time, not just for a, a week or two weeks and then moving on to another place. Here's a large and complex dwelling. It's about six meters across by five meters in this direction. It could have easily handled one family or two families, and perhaps even more. And this is only one of a lot of what we call permanent dwellings only occupied semi-sedentarily. That is, several months here, maybe even up to six months, and maybe up to a full year. Um, 
one of the things that was very surprising when we were excavating this, this, this house, that particular house you saw, is that we put in a test trench that went through the floor. This is the floor of the house right here. And we encountered this red, gritty soil. And it wasn't only under structure number W80, it was also under structure number W66. This is a red, gritty soil, very unlike any of the sediment that you see anywhere else in the Black Desert today. When it rained, when it rains today, the water washes off the surface immediately. It does not sink into the soil. But with this kind of soil uh, structure, it would penetrate into the soil. It would, the soil became a reservoir for water, not so much for people to drink, but for plants, so that there were plants out there that had a constant source of water uh, for six months after, well, let's say four months after the end of the rainy season. Today, two or three weeks after the end of the rainy season, there's nothing out there. It all dries up and blows away. So uh, there was a very different kind of landscape, a soil out there instead of just bare rocks, and a soil that was uh, rich in moisture and therefore very densely uh, uh, vegetated with a variety of different kinds of uh, uh, plants. Here's a, a rather poor attempt at my cartooning. Um, but here at 6500 BC, which is about the age of most of our structures out there, um, it's, it's a little bit too low, but you can see a green plain out here, a red soil, and this guy who is very tall and weird looking uh, <laughs> with his goat. These people were living in not a desert, not a steppe, well, yeah, maybe a step, a savanna, a grassland, a dry grassland that would have provided a long, a very long-term uh, opportunity for people to remain out there. Now, sometime around 2000 BC, or perhaps uh, beginning around 2500 BC, the aridity became more and more and more severe. And since 6500 BC, there were an awful lot of sheep and goats, and the size of the population of sheep and goats continued to expand over time, so that there were all these little hoofs of, or hooves, I don't know, uh, that are like chisels, and they were breaking into the surface of that soil that was absolutely necessary. And because they broke uh, the surface of the soil, it all blew off into Iraq and Saudi Arabia, uh, to the point that it was only protected under the houses um, that we excavated. Now, this yellow dot here is where we've been excavating at Rasad Pools. That, uh, here are the pools here. They would fill up with water during the rainy season. This one probably held 20,000 cubic meters of water. This one right here, 2,000 cubic meters of water. And that would last for a very long time. Uh, the red soil that we found under the houses were also found in this mudflat, this ka, um, about two and a half meters below the surface of, uh, of the modern surface. And in that ka, that layer of red soil produced pollen. And po every species of plant has a different shape of pollen, different size, different shape, different kind of... Uh, decoration on the material, and of those, we had a lot of tree pollen. In addition to oak, this is oak trees, um, which we also had charcoal in some of the fireplaces at uh, W80, uh, we knew that there were at least small stands of oak trees there, but there was also pine, juniper, uh, hop hornbeam, whatever that is. Um, it's a very hardwood, very heavy and dense, and would have been excellent for uh, fires, but it's also very difficult to chop because it is so hard and dense. And then elm tree as well. Um, the pollen that was not tree pollen was probably the most surprising. Now for, I don't know if there is this kind of duckweed here in the Near East, but this is a pond. 
Uh, this is probably in the United States or in Germany, I don't know. But there's in the Total Valley quite a lot. Oh yeah? Cool. Yes. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> now we've got it out in the Black Desert. Yes. Um, so this, that genus, Blenna, or duckweed, would uh, certainly indicates a marshy kind of marshy kind of uh, is that okay? Thank you. A marshy kind of uh, landscape, probably around the Ka itself. But we have a lot of Kian, we have a lot of those mud flats out there, so it would probably was you know, dotting the entire landscape around the site. Um, also pollen from that soil included bulrushes or cattails. Um, and this probably was a very important economic resource because, first of all, the roots of cattails are very long, very heavy, and very nutritious. Let them dry, pound them on the grinding stone into a powder, add water, throw it on the, on the fire, and you've got breakfast. Uh, it's like bread, in a, in a sense. Uh, the shafts could be used for arrow, sh arrow shafts. Um, all of the leaves of that material can be woven into shelters, and now I'm starting to think that our shelters were mostly covered with either this or another kind of plant, I'll get to that. But baskets, very important kind of utility, which we never find in an archaeological site this old. And then finally, matting. Put that on the floor and it doesn't make any difference. If it's dirt, uh, you, you don't have to worry too much about it. One thing that doesn't show any kind of uh, that we can't be definite about is whether or not there were reeds. Now, those of you who have been out to Azarok, to the uh, wetlands area, are familiar with the reeds that grow around all of that uh, water. They are a very aggressive species, um, and in fact, in the 19 teens or 20s or something, uh, they imported water buffalo to keep the reeds from covering the entire water surface. Um, unfortunately, Phragmites is a species that's included in, ah, sorry, didn't mean that, included in this uh, family or genus, whatever it is, Poaceae. And you can't very easily distinguish not only one species from another, but one genus from another. So we have all, anything that's not tree pollen is almost all Poaceae, and that includes grasses and bamboos. Now, you say, wait a minute, you can't argue with evidence like that. You don't have any positive indications of it. Well, back up. Yes, we do. Those reed shafts, these things right here, are hollow, or you can make them hollow very easily. That makes them light. And you can put an arrowhead on the end of one of those things and send that arrow for whatever, 100 meters or something like that. Um, and, but you notice that on those shafts there are these <coughs> joins. If you've seen bamboo, you know this, uh, you take your finger up, take your fingers up along it and you go whoop, whoop, whoop. That's not good for arrow shafts. That's what these kinds of artifacts are used for. That little slot there, you just, you heat the stones up, you rub back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until all of those joins are absent. And if there weren't reeds, there is no reason to have these kinds of shaft straighteners or close. You wouldn't need them out there unless there were reeds. Um, going back to the oaks, the Taboar oak or Quercus ithaborensis is the most prolific producer of acorns known in the entire oak family. Hundreds of thousands of acorns uh, within, you know, 100 square meters, or even 10 square meters, I mean. Um, one of the nice things about acorns is you can store them for a very long period of time. You don't have to eat them all up at the same time. Uh, another thing is that, uh, well, let me start that over again. Uh, acorns, have you, anybody tried to eat an acorn? Yeah, and you almost died. Yeah, it's not a happy thing. There's a, a poison, a tannic acid in the acorn itself that makes it inedible for human beings. But 
you can wash that stuff up. You can grind. You can uh, grind the. Whoops! Ah, no, I didn't want that. Uh, you can grind the acorns in these deep cup holes into a powder again. Put them in that tight, tightly woven baskets that we saw that you can use from cattails. Um, that you can weave these baskets. Put that in the water and keep moving back and forth, and it washes the tannins out. And that uh, uh, acorn mush is, again, very nutritious. It's got a lot of calories, a lot of fats, uh, a lot of vitamin B12 and whatever these vitamins are. So this is, again, something that, was, that we hadn't even expected, that there would be that kind of sort of food pantry out there for these people uh, in the Black Desert. And again, emphasizing that there were trees out there. So far, we have found five axes. Yeah, five axes from two of the uh, structures we've excavated. And again, why this, this one right here probably weighs about a half a pound. Why are you going to carry that around if there aren't any trees to chop down or branches to cut off? Now, one of the things. One of the strange things about reading all that earlier research is that we had the impression that we had very few people running around during the late Neolithic period uh, because there were a few sites that were found in surveys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but when we first went out in 2008, uh, we saw two areas that certainly belied all of that negative feeling you got from reading about the way or about uh, um, Here in Wasad Pools, which is on the eastern edge of the Black Desert, we found literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of structures out there all in the same place. So here we have uh, one, uh, about 10 uh, square acre, uh, uh, square hectares. No, no, 10 square kilometers in this area. Um, although it's only in this region that we've paid any attention because that's where the core is. That's where the most uh, densely clustered uh, the areas are. And here again, hundreds of structures, including tombs, including towers, including uh, some kind of cultic uh, uh, buildings, we think. But still, maybe 200 to 300 dwellings, houses that these people built out of the basalt that was out there. Um, this is a kite, for, I mean, a, a photograph uh, that we used to map all of, the, all of the things. It took us an entire four weeks to map 110, no, 117 uh, structures. Now, through the use of drones, we've been able to map just about everything uh, in this area that you see uh, in, what was it, a half hour? <laughs> Something like that. Um, so, uh, here we have, well, I, I don't want to say that all of those houses were occupied at the same time. We're not looking at downtown Zarka. Um, instead, we may have had clusters of families, so that the Rollisons lived over there, and the Saadis lived over there, the Salwas over there, but many of them may have lived together at the same time for the same months uh, that they occupied those houses. Um, this is the attraction. I mentioned it before. These pools down here would trap rainwater during the summer, uh, during the winter, and it made it uh, a very nice place, not only for the people, but for the sheep and goats that they had with them. They were shepherds, uh, but also it would attract animals. So these people are not Bedouin. They're not, you know, a lot of people say these are paleo-Bedouin. That's not true. They don't have camels. Uh, but they were able to hunt to provide most of the food, and they didn't have to kill, didn't have to slaughter their own sheep and goats very much. Uh, it looks like only about 10% of all of the animal bones that we've collected now, only 10% are from sheep and goats. The rest, almost all of it's gazelle. So anyway, uh, 
lot of people out there. Yeah, this is that last pool that's half a kilometer long and probably had 20,000 cubic meters of water. By the time we get out there in June, usually the Bedouin in their big tanker trucks back up and pump the water out. So there's not very much left here at the beginning of the summer when we arrived. Um, we excavated one structure called W66. It's relatively large, about four and a half meters in diameter. Um, it had a plaster basin on the floor. The floor itself was completely plastered, very much like Rang Gazal, if you pardon the reference. Um, a central pillar that may have held up some of the roofing, we're not sure. Uh, it may also have been completely cultic, as far as I know. A little niche back in here, an alcove that, again, was plastered four separate times, at least four separate times. So probably a single family dwelling, four and a half meters in the Um Produced a lot of stone tools. This is that, we're back, oh, wait a minute, let me go back here. Uh, you can't see it because it's too far down. 6,530 BC. So we're right. Now, this is very close to the beginning of this population explosion out there. In this house, uh, at the bottom, 6,585 BC, and then it was occupied for almost a thousand years, but not continuously. I don't want to give you the impression that these people kept on coming back to the same house for a thousand years. There were droughts, and there were droughts that lasted for hundreds of years. So the differences in all of these dates here might represent the span of time between the good rainfall and the drought. That's a possibility. Uh, but the variability in this architecture is also interesting. I mean, this is very complex. Uh, it's got a court, courtyard out in the front. It's got a little workspace here that we call the porch P, a small doorway leading in, an area here. These are big, heavy grinding stones. Um, a little alcove again, like in that house we just saw before. We're not sure what it was used for. This is probably the main room, and then this large door. Uh, probably the main entrance coming into the house. Now, the other area that we've concentrated is in the Wadi al Qatafi, which is about 60 kilometers, two hours uh, drive east of Azra. Um, these mesas are <coughs> the remnants of a terrible period of volcanic eruption. Now, most of us think of a volcano as just exploding and sending stuff all over the, the, the world, but not here. This was a roiling, a boiling of material out from under the ground, but not explosively. It just created this very thick layer of basalt that would have been a true basalt desert. There's no way that you could have plants growing on top of it. But that was at least 14 million years ago. And in the past 14 million years, the Earth's crust has moved and shifted and cracked, and all of the basalt I don't have a picture of it. All of the basalt is on top of limestone. Limestone is the old seabed from 100 million uh, years ago. But those cracks made it possible for rainfall to go through the cracks, erode the limestone, so that you would get growing wadis under the basalt, and then finally the basalt would fall in. And this is the only thing that's left. Each one of these hilltops is covered by anywhere up to 10 to 14 meters of that basalt flow. Um, but below it, the rest of the hill is all uh, limestone. Now, just based on aerial photography that David Kennedy and Bob Buley did a number of years ago, we were looking at, you can see, well, well, now, we've estimated that there are 600 structures that are more most likely dwellings, again, houses. Uh, they're usually found at the base of the mesas. Uh, very occasionally there are some uh, dwellings up on top, but they tend to be uh, very small and probably date to the Bronze Age. These down here at the base look like they might all belong to the late Neolithic period. Um, here, for example, Mesa number seven, where we've been working for the last two years, Mesa number six, Mesa number five, 
all of these, all of these sort of circular structures are houses. Um, just around M7 alone, 287. Around the base of Mesa 5, more than 55, I believe. Uh, the, the numbers are astounding. And again, these are permanent structures. These are not camps. These are not tents that people occupy for only a few uh, nights. These are, in fact, structures where people spend a considerable amount of time every year. Um, now, our two sites, which, is, which are here Q and W, are astonishing in the number of uh, houses. But there are also other sites up here at uh, Bachit and another at uh, the Cairn Field, that's the name that David Kennedy called it, and up at uh, uh, Hossein, there are similar concentrations of houses. This is a, and there are probably even more, uh, but these are the only ones that have been identified on Google Earth. And this indicates that during the late Neolithic period, beginning at around 6,500, or perhaps even 6,800 BC, that the population out here was relatively huge, certainly compared to today, um, that the landscape could support not only a lot more vegetation, and therefore a lot more animals, but a lot more people. And they all built houses. Um, uh, so, the question comes up, who are all these people? Why did we suddenly see this, you know, hundredfold increase, perhaps, in the population? Or 50 times the amount of population out there compared to when there were only hunters and gatherers? Where did they come from? There are several hypotheses. Um, one of them is that the hunters and gatherers who were out there before the late Neolithic, during what we call the PPNB period, that those hunters and gatherers managed to get hold of sheep and goats. And because of that, this spurred their population uh, to grow. And that what we're witnessing here is simply the uh, importation of a new way of life. Well, you can't say that it's impossible that that happened. But I think it's unlikely, principally because of a few things. First of all, it's a major change in lifestyle. And it seems to happen very quickly. Um, people who are picking up their tents, their, their, maybe not even tents, just moving from campsite to campsite to campsite, suddenly being placed in one place for months at a time, is not probably very easy uh, to accommodate in one's sort of world view. Um, hunters eat what they shoot. If animals are around, you shoot them, and then you eat them. But if you've got sheep and goats, that's not a good idea, because sheep and goats, you've got to keep the population going. Um, so you get a delayed gratification, which does not seem consistent with the psychology of a hunter and gatherer. And again, in almost all of the sites that I've talked about so far, Sheep and goats only account for 10%, roughly 10% of the animal bones. And I would certainly say that increasing your diet by 10% is not going to in, uh, result in an enormous population explosion. Um, and it ignores the possibility that there are other people coming out from other areas. So this is the model. Here's Ein Ghazal as a uh, sort of a reference point that this area here, which separates the steppe and desert from the agricultural area, it was only the hunters and gatherers that occupied this region because they had acquired sheep and goats. A second hypothesis says that you know, there, there's more than one population out there in what we call the body of today, which includes the steppe uh, east of Zarka. <coughs> um, it says that there was one population that was fairly close to the agricultural area, but then there was a separate population, and I, yeah, I, 
you almost get the interpretation that it's a different ethnic group out in the black desert and uh, in the rest of the, the area. And these two populations would come together, overlap occasionally on a seasonal basis perhaps, exchange information, exchange uh, some kinds of resources or whatever, um, and then go back to their separate locations again. Well, here again, it does not explain the sudden suddenness of that population growth. So it, it seems to me that this is fairly unlikely. And secondly, how do you distinguish between these two populations? If you say there are two populations, show me how you, you can separate that population from that population. So I'm not terrible, terribly fond of this one. This one, and here's the kind of model. So that people who were getting more and more uh, sheep and goats farther and farther away from my gazal didn't go very far. Maybe they went to, I can't even think of any towns up there. Uh, maybe they went out as far as Halabat, something like that. But this area here was the population that uh, uh, had accepted sheep and goats. This is the one that I appreciate most, mainly because I made it up. <laughs> First of all, there was a period of time, even in the late PPNV, remember these, these farming towns in the western part of Jordan, the highlands, were mega sites, maybe 2,000, 3,000 to 4,000 people. Um, and they had a lot of sheep and goats. And a lot of sheep and goats are going to be trouble in terms of keeping them out of fields where your wheat and barley and whatever else is you're growing. So, uh, People had to take their sheep and goats out of uh, these towns for long periods of time until the harvest was over. And so there was a pressure of sheep and goats out there that forced people into uh, an area where there was no farming. Um, in fact, it reached a point you had to take the sheep and goats so far away, you couldn't bring them back in one day. You couldn't bring them back in two days or three days. And so people were already developing a kind of lifestyle out there where they could live for two or three months during the growing season in camps or whatever and then come back later on uh, after the, the harvest is over. Now, we know that there were domesticated sheep and goats out in the Azraq Basin by the late PPNB before 7,000 BC. Um, we have two kinds of architecture during the PPNC period, which begins just after 7000 BC. Um, one is a very crude sort of house with dirt floors and one room, uh, but there's a second one which is a storage facility, probably for the people who take the sheep and goats out and then come back later on uh, after the harvest. Um, we're now getting PPNC dates at Wadi Katafi at the Mesas and at uh, Wasad Pools at 6,500, 6,000, 6,600 BC. It explains why we have so many people out there. And I'm coming back to this explanation in a little bit. Um, they became hunters and herders out there. They already knew delayed gratification. You already knew you don't shoot your own sheep and goats. You shoot the stupid gazelle. It's a very easy to hunt. Um, and the distance between even Wasad Pools, which is 120 kilometers east of Basra, that distance is still not so great that those people in Wasad could come all the way back to Ain Gazal, to Zarka, to other uh, uh, late Neolithic populations, the Armukian populations back west. Um, so, this model then says that in the PPNC, beginning at around 7000 BC, we begin to see a massive movement of populations into uh, what today is the Steppen Desert. Now, a little chronology. I mentioned late PPNB. This is the period of time when Ein Gazal, Basta down by Petra, and uh, uh, some of these other uh, farming sites exploded in population. I guess all went from about 1,000 people to about 3,000 people in about uh, 300 years, 400 years. 
Uh, at 6,900 BC, we see a complete, well, it's a degeneration of uh, kind of a moralistic uh, frame, but the lifestyle changed dramatically at about 6,900 BC, and it ushered in something called the PPNC. And then finally, the Yarmoukian and Ayn Ghazal is the equivalent of the late Neolithic in the desert. And that starts somewhere around 6,400 BC. Um, now, those mega sites like Ayn Ghazal, which were so large, Ayn Ghazal is 15 hectares. Um, they, we have uh, Wadi Shoeb, which is the same size, so probably the same population. Uh, Tel Abu Suwan, we're not really sure how large that site is, but it looks like another mega site. Uh, a site that has been under investigation now for only three years or four years by a Spanish team is called Horizon, and it is more than half again as large as Ayn Ghazal. It's the biggest Neolithic site uh, anywhere in the Near East. And we have Ayn Ghazal and Safaya, uh, Saya, no, it's Safaya uh, in the Mujib, and then Basta down here, maybe Baja as well. But take a look at the estimated populations here. Well, you can't see it in the back. But 3,000, 2,500, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 3,000, uh, 1,500, upwards of 19,000 people faced an awful lot of trouble at 7,000 BC. And the reason for that is this dramatic drop in precipitation. Look at that. Boom, wow. Um, reaching the modern uh, level of precipitation. This is based on dead sea levels. Um, that meant that these people who had been living in these big farming, been living in these big farming areas, uh, didn't have enough rainfall to have enough food to feed 3,000 people or 4,000 people. The southern sites, down in the Wadi Mujib, down near Petra, were abandoned completely. Nobody lived beyond 7,000 BC. They left. Ein Ghazal had 3,000 people, 90% of the population leaves, leaving 300 people at Ein Ghazal. Now, where did those people go? Some may have gone back to Palestine. Some may have gone up into Syria, but not in large numbers because they don't show up on the radar. They don't show up in archaeological surveys. I would guess that of that 19,000 people, probably 90% of them moved out into uh, the desert, today's desert. Um, now, the suggestion that we had two populations may be, I think I'm reading on that. Uh, the, I have strong breath. It's nothing to do with food. Thank you, sir. Um, to say that there are two populations, separate populations out there, I think is underestimating it completely. Because we've got a lot of variability in a variety of ways uh, in the sites that uh, are out there. So we were excavating here in uh, Mesa 7, and this is our excavation of a house down here. <coughs> um, the interesting thing about those 287 houses around Mesa 7 is that they are not scattered out there randomly. Instead, they tend to form clusters of anywhere from four to seven structures, maybe even eight structures in some places. But it looks like we have family groups, maybe, maybe grandpa and grandma and a bunch of you know, sons and grandsons and granddaughters and stuff out there. Um, and so when we looked at this is SS1. This is the one we excavated com completely last year. Um, so we have other uh, structures around here. And we only excavated that one. But, and we thought these were all houses. And I'm, I suspect still that SS3, 4, 5, and 7 are houses as well. Here you can see SS1, very nicely done. York, uh, 
Moray, very nicely done. 6,400 BC, kind of right at the beginning of the late Neolithic, right at the very end of the PPNC. 150 arrowheads, 906 special tools uh, called burins. Uh, I've got a picture of one later on. Uh, look at that. Now that was five meters in diameter. That's SS1 up here. This is SS7, and the structure is very small. Where we are sure that, at, I am sure, SS1, this one, was not a house. I think it was a workshop. Um, God, the fireplaces in there are enormous. Uh, I don't want to get into all of that, but here, SS7 almost looks like uh, some of these small hotel rooms in Japanese airports. <laughs> I mean, it's only two and a half by one and a half meters. Um, you could sleep in that, uh, but you couldn't do very much else in, in, a, in the structure. And by the way, this is not excavated by us. This was looting that took place last year. Um, up at SS3, just up uphill a little bit from SS1. Again, a structure that's only about three meters by two meters. Remember what we had at Rasad Pools, six meters in diameter, five meters in diameter. And here we have these teeny little things. This is at Maitland's Mesa down here. And again, it's one of these sort of uh, hotel rooms. Other kinds of variability show up in the stone tools that they're making. Um, SS7 is at uh, Wadi al Kakafi in, in the mesas. Um, it seems to be a different group of people in terms of the tools they're using. At uh, W80, 646 projectile points inside that house. At uh, W66 in uh, Wasai, 17% uh, of all the tools were arrowheads. 30% uh, at W80, only 7% at SS1. Now, I don't think this means that those people were not hunting as much. I think it has to do with the nature of that work, workhouse, that workstation instead. But even so, when we look at the different uh, styles of arrowheads, there is a major distinction. I hope this is coming up. This, uh, this kind of arrowhead called transverse, uh, transverse arrowheads has very sharp edges up here, they're like razor blades. This is put into the shaft so that when you release that arrow, you're shooting a razor blade. 90% of all of, the, of those 646 arrowheads at W80 were transverse arrowheads. Zero transverse arrowheads at SS1, although these are transverse arrowheads, but this is like somebody who's four years old is trying to make a transverse arrowhead. Somebody told these guys, well, the transverse arrowhead kind of looks like this. Try it out. And they didn't succeed. Uh, instead, almost 100%, well, all of those arrowheads minus two, uh, are these style. This kind is not found in Wasad pools. This kind is not found uh, with any reliability in uh, the Wadi Katafi. So we've got some major differences here in how they're hunting. If we go down, uh, oh, it's easy. Yeah. Tech. Uh, another thing that uh, a striking difference difference are these tools called burins. Getting close to half of all the tools from SS1 were these tools that may have been used for uh, carving wood, engraving wood or bone, of uh, uh, producing long shafts of flint that may have been used as drills for making beads. Um, another, uh, well, I have to see what the next slide is, I forgot. Yeah, ah, and denticulates. So denticulates, very high, uh, almost a fifth in uh, W66, and certainly 10%, but very low in SS7. Uh, so this is a burin. And those arrows indicate how they knocked off one of the sharp edges of that blade. And that intersection right there is like a chisel. 
so you can use it for engraving uh, or carving. Uh, and that long spike that came off is perfect for making drills. So you can make beads or drill wood, drill bone, whatever it is you want to drill. Now this frightening stone tool is called a denticulate. Denticulate is related to teeth. You go to a dentist. Um, and these are perfect saws. And remember, we probably at W80 probably have reeds. You can't break a reed. You've got to cut it. You can't pull a reed out of the mud and you'll get a hernia. You have to cut it. And these saws would have been perfect for that. And then again, these reeds might be three meters long. So you cut them down into one meter uh, lengths for your arrow shafts. So a lot of stuff uh, related to probably woodwork uh, with denticulates. In combination with these tools here called wedges, if you notice, there's a lot of battering on that edge and a lot of battering, oops, oh, a lot of battering up on this top and a lot of battering down here. They've been pounding that into something, splitting, again, splitting reeds, splitting uh, bone, splitting wood for whatever reason you might want split reeds, bone, and wood. Um, but these are very high at uh, Wasad 66 and Wasad 80. Um, this is kind of an interesting situation here. Drills are virtually absent in uh, uh, all of these. Uh, they, they account for less than 5%, I think, of all the tools. Um, it's always been assumed, sort of mistakenly, that drills were used for making stone beads. But look at the number of beads and the number of drills. The number of beads, the number of drills, the number of beads. 247 drills, and you got 39 beads. Okay, maybe we've got some trade going on. Maybe they're sending a lot of those beads out. But I think probably they're using those drills for a lot of different things besides simply uh, making beads. Um, now, these stones all represent sort of the mother stone. When, when you want to make an arrowhead, you knock off a chip and then you shape that chip. So the stone from which that chip, chip came is called a core. Now, if we look at the different uh, kinds of cores, blade, bladelets are very short and very narrow, um, 10, centimeters, uh, 10 millimeters in width. So a considerable number of these are being produced for making some kind of a tool that you want to be short and narrow. Uh, but over an SS7, nothing. Not even 1% of bladelet production. This is the kind of core that comes out very short and very narrow. Um, blades themselves, on the other hand, are very high over in SS7. And look at the length of this thing. Compare the, uh, the scales here. These are very long. So they're making a lot of blades for the tools, but not any uh, bladelets. And then finally, something called microflakes. Microflake cores are about two and a half centimeters in maximum dimension. Sort of the size of your last thumb joint. Some of them, like this one, look at that. It's only about a centimeter in maximum dimension. About the size of your little fingernail. What are they doing with these things in uh, W66 and in W80? They were made producing flakes that were less than one and a half centimeters in length. You can't even hold that in your grubby fingers. I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a big, oops, a big question mark. Uh, here are some of the polyhedrons. Uh, a meter long, no, a, a centimeter long. Um, but again, this is the size of my little fingernail. Big question. So, conclusions? Well, maybe. Um, certainly, I think that we've got a lot more variability in social, social cultural uh, phenomena out there than just two populations. Um, I think we have a lot of groups who are in contact with each other but don't really appreciate what the other group does in order to make a living. 
We see it in different architectural styles. Uh, we see it in the hunting practices with those arrowheads. Uh, we see it in terms of group sizes. Uh, those sites that Allison Betts uh, excavated back in the 1980s are all up in the northern part of uh, the Haga of the Black Desert. Um, and maybe it wasn't quite as nice in terms of landscape and vegetation as down in the south. Um, and then sedentism. Um, it might be that these people, um, some of the people stayed all year round, while some of the people came back to the west um, uh, for trade <laughs> populations. So uh, we're still left with how many, how many different groups we had out there. And there's no way to really tell for certain right now, anyway. Now, I just brought up movement. And I mentioned earlier that uh, it was not impossible for people to leave with sod pools way up there uh, and get all the way down behind us all um, with no problem. And I emphasize with no problem. Uh, when I was visiting Peter Ackerman's this uh, year, um, he mentioned that the, the guard at the, the camp where he lives lived in Jof in Saudi Arabia, and he and his family and their 200 sheep, whatever the number was, went all the way from Jof to Palmyra in whatever it was, three weeks or something. I, I don't remember the amount of time. But here, um, all of those other, so we've got, uh, we've got Wasad pools up here, Landing ground F is what the Air Force called it. It's a, another one of these mud flats that would have had a lot of water in the rainy season, even up to after the harvest was in the Nag Um And this is out by, well, as you can see, between Wasad Pools and uh, Wadi Qatafi. Landing ground E is within a kilometer of Wadi Qatafi. Uh, landing ground D and one I just made up because I don't know what the name is. Uh, Azraq, of course, always had a lot of water. All of these form a chain that could be uh, crossed in 11 days or more. There's no reason to hurry. This would have still been uh, uh, sort of pasture land out there for the sheep and goats. There's water everywhere. And again, Will Willie Longacre, <laughs> Longacre <laughs> Lancaster, who studied the Zerwala Bedouin for a long time, said that a march of 20 kilometers per day is an average. You can push sheep and goats, they don't have to drink every day, you can push sheep and goats from one water uh, source to another water source, even if it's 40 kilometers long. And if you are really pressed, you can do 60. Um, and all of these distances, as you can see, are uh, not more than 25, but frequently uh, much, much shorter. Well, another thing that uh, Willie Lancaster said was that uh, we should also consider that sheep and goats can be used as pack animals, and not carrying everything with you on your own backs. And this is very likely an important thing if the uh, hunter-herders out here were hunting all of these gazelle and then taking the gazelle hides with them to the farming villages over here and exchanging not just the lambs and the kids, but also gazelle hides for textiles, for wheat and barley, for whatever else these people want uh, in return. And so, more speculation. Oh, sorry, this is just a... Uh, a repeat of an, of an earlier one. Um, but I think we have to look at the possibility that we have many populations that may not have had, in fact, the same language. Um, we don't know, for example, if we go from uh, Khaisan up by uh, Jarash all the way down to Basta, whether or not these people spoke the same language. That's you know, 400 kilometers or 300 kilometers or so. And it's possible that it was only at the borders between these sort of territories that we had bilingual people. And so it's a possibility that we had multi-ethnic groups out here as well. Something to consider. We don't have any proof of that. So uh, my thanks go to 
everybody in the crew that has worked with us, um, the National Endowment of Humanities, which brought me out here again this year, very nice. ACOR, of course, um, our home institutions back in the States, and the DOA, of course, which has also been very loud. Thank you very much. <laughs>